All right, I believe yep, we are recording now. Okay, great. So we are going to be talking about sectionals and how to make them more effective, uh, more efficient. I'm killing time while I try to share my screen. So there we go. Let's just get my desktop shared. All right. Oh, stop it. It wants me to update the app. Not now. All right. So making sectionals count, making them count. You know, what are, what are some things that we can do to make that time that we have in sectionals uh, more effective? Okay, now let's move on here. So the first thing that I did when I was thinking about this um, was what are kind of the factors that are involved in a really effective not just sectional, but any rehearsal, uh, you know, and I'll just fly through these bullet points and then we're gonna address each one of these bullet points one at a time. Um, culture building, culture of excellent prof excellence, professionalism and accountability. Uh, we could do an entire series of uh, conversations about how to build culture, but we'll just kind of touch on it a little bit here today. Uh, setting realistic goals for the rehearsal in the sectional, uh, having the necessary tools to have uh, an effective sectional, understanding the power of your words, and then getting consistency across that ensemble. You know, not just with your horn line, but with your woodwind section, if you have one, or your percussion section, your guard, all that stuff. So we're gonna move right into this. And again, Luke, just jump in if anybody has any questions. All right, so culture of excellence, professionalism, accountability, any other buzzword you want. But the most important thing that um, I think it is is to find an identity. Um, like, like out here in Arizona, I don't know how it is for you, uh, but there's a lot of different types of marching band programs or drum corps programs. You know, you could have um, like a, a program that's really, really um, centered towards the judging sheets on like Bands of America or a regional circuit. And it's often you have to kind of decide what type of band you want to have. You know, do you want to have that kind of marching wind ensemble, that real nice controlled brass section, you know, that blends and balances super, super well? Or do you want to have more of that kind of drum corps style, good old fashioned G bugle, blow your face off type of horn line? You know, but my, I always tell young directors um, out here that I work with, you need to find out what you want your identity to be, and then you need to be that no matter what anybody says. You know, and, and not just for one year, for two years, for three years, for four seasons, however long, find an identity, because that's going to really start to kind of paint the picture of the culture of your ensemble. You know, it, it, it's, it's, are you going to be like a, a college band, you know, more of a pet band, or are you going to be a real serious, um, uh, like more like drum corps related ensemble? Uh, the next point is the standard. I, uh, we'll talk about the standard a lot. Uh, I'm actually going to stop sharing so I can see you, but I can't see my mouth. I hate this. There we go. Oh. All right, so I like to see you guys while I talk to you, but I'm trying to get through. There we go. All right, sorry about that. Darn it. I always do this and then it always gets all jacked up. Okay, so the standard. Um, I One thing that I like to say, like kind of a little quote is you don't really compete against other bands. You compete against your set of standards. Um, and you've got to decide what is that standard, you know, and I'm talking about the level of their play and it needs to be appropriate for where they're at uh, as musicians. But until you kind of establish what is the kind of baseline norm for your ensemble playing for your level of, you know, tolerance to mistakes, timing errors, intonation errors, you got to find out what that standard is and start working to build towards that. Everything that you do with your kids, with your staff to reach that standard, that's what your culture is. That's what your culture is. You know, are, are you trying to build a culture of preparedness where your students show up and they know the parts? They're prepared. You know, that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of time. But that's definitely a culture thing. Um, you know, how do you rehearse? 
what's the tone of your rehearsals? That's all a huge part of building culture and getting to your standard. Yeah, um, you know, what is the attendance of the rehearsals? You know, um, I like to tell a little story about um, kind of why I really started thinking about um, why I really, how I started thinking about like talking to people about how to run better sectionals or better rehearsals. I was at um, a school that I work with in uh, Mesa, Arizona. Um, band director is a great friend of mine. I write the show there. Um, I'm the program coordinator. I teach the brass section. And I was meeting with him just to talk about the show. And it was during their school's lunchtime and I was just in his office and we were chatting. And I noticed that there was a bunch of kids coming into the band room at lunch, getting, and, and I'm looking out there and it's the trombone section. I'm like, okay. So the trombone section, they're getting out their instruments and they're getting in an arc. I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? This is incredible. Like we're at lunchtime right now. And I've got kids that are in there with their instruments out and they're about to have an organized rehearsal. Well, I, organized rehearsals. <laughs> so I became quickly went from happiness to terrified when I saw how the rehearsal was going. So I pulled the section leader in and I'm like, you're not doing anything um, the way that we do it in rehearsal. You're not, you're, you don't have a metronome. You don't have a tuner. You don't even know what chunks you want to work on. You just ran seven chunks in 30 minutes. You know, run the chunk once. Okay, that sounds good. Let's go to the next one. No, so, so that's kind of what like kind of sparked into my head. I was like, we've got to come up with a plan on how these student run sectionals can become much, much more effective. Okay. And, and it's all kind of dealing with culture. But so this particular program, it's got a pretty good culture. They've got kids that want to show up at lunch and practice, but now how do we empower them and how do we give them the tools and the equipment that's going to make that time beneficial? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have everything that you need for a sectional, you should just not have it. There's no point in running chunks at the wrong tempo, unless you're going slow and speeding it up. But if you're running the ballad at like 130, you know, that's not going to help anybody. You know, that, that's not going to help anybody. So that's kind of what sort of got the, the, my brain sort of, you know, really thinking about that. But um, attendance, if, the, if most of the section isn't going to show up, it's, it's, it, becomes, it becomes a question of whether or not it's even worth doing it. You know, you need, you need to have attendance. If you, if you have a culture where the kids aren't showing up regularly for, for rehearsal, you know, it's kind of seeming like to be an optional thing, then there's obviously some cultural things that you need to, um, that you need to address. And then obviously preparation. If, if they're walking into a sectional and they have literally no clue how this thing is going, then we just really have a lot of work to do with culture before we even worry too much about any of this other stuff. But um, like I said, culture building is, we could talk for, we could talk once a Saturday for a year and still not have covered it all. But um, before we go on, does anyone have any questions about like, you know, or, or, or if you want to share like an instance that maybe like you had, you saw the kids were kind of in their, in the right place, their, their intentions were good, but they were just horrifically unprepared and not doing it correctly. Um, or any questions about culture before we move on. I do want to get more into the nitty gritty of it, but we good. Cool. Yeah, that's real general type information, but good stuff to think about. All right, let's get back onto this here and we're gonna to move to the next slide. All right, so setting realistic goals. Um, I thought to myself, what is, what is the right number of excerpts that you should be looking at in like a 30 minute time period? Obviously, if you have three hours, you can adjust that, you know, um, but most of the time, if you're doing sectionals, it's pretty quick. You know, what is the realistic amount of like little little two to four bar chunks you can work on? Um, and we kind of came up with two to three. You know, if you're going to have a 30 minute sectional, uh, whether you're running it or your, your section leader is running it, you want to make sure that either you or your section leader is selecting just a couple of, of, of problem areas. 
Uh, if it's a section leader run rehearsal, you definitely want them to share with you what they're planning on working on and make sure that it's in line with your plan. You know, if it's ballad week, if you're working on the ballad super hard, um, you know, for, for the next seven days or learn, you know, it's obviously not going to be very effective to have sectional time on the opener. Um, you know, if, if you, you want to make sure that, that the, the excerpts that they're selecting are appropriate for what you have planned or the visual staff has planned, you know, uh, kind of having that common, common vision, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but you definitely don't want to clean the whole show in 30 minutes. Uh, that's not going to go well for anybody. Uh, two to three excerpts. And who's picking the excerpts? You know, clearly that should be either be you, unless you have a really, really, really um, like mature and gifted section leader that can kind of follow along with you. If you have a brass staff, if you have like a brass caption head, um, that's definitely something that you want to sit down with or either on a conference call or like half hour before rehearsal, um, sit down with the whole staff and just kind of have a chat about what are we working on this week and let's make sure that our sectional time is, is working towards um, all of that. You know, and you know, obviously there's, there's different variants to all of that that you as professionals are gonna have to just kind of, you know, if you're looking at a super, super technical excerpt, that's like the hardest part of the show, maybe you just work on one excerpt. You know, if your problem is, oh, we're playing the ballad and you know, we've got all these you know, irresponsible breaths and all these holes in the sound. You might want to pick maybe a bit, a bit of a longer ex excerpt that you can, you know, make them work, you know, throughout and see if you can um, find those spots. You know, so it's not always going to be two or three. It may be one. You know, it, it, I guess it, it could be four. You know, if you have like little short, like two bar little flurries of notes and you have like four of them, you can hit that up in 30 minutes. Um, but again, you just have to be strategic and, and very, very kind of like common sense oriented in how you're laying out the plan for your sectional and the goals for your sectional. Cool. Any questions about that or pretty straightforward, I think. Honestly, like some of you, some of you might be going, oh my gosh, that's such a great idea. And a lot of you are probably going, yeah, I know. All right, shut up. Let's, let's, so, so I'm trying just to kind of cover all my bases here. Right. Can I just jump yeah. back of it? Jump in, yeah. Um, so you said about like if it's ballad week, then don't do a sectional on the opener. Would you recommend going through and doing like this week's ballad week, this week's opener week, instead of just every week is a full show week? Well, um, I mean, I, I found that like you have more sectional time. Like we really lean on the sectional time more towards the beginning of the season as opposed to more towards the end, where obviously at the end of the season, we're super, super focused on the ensemble, uh, on how all of that is working together. Um, but early in the year, I think it's really good to, as you're learning drill, as you're learning music, to have more of a kind of tight focus. Now, there, there's a million ways to do this right. You know, there's a million ways to do this right. This is just one way. You know, Your way could be totally working for you. And this isn't about me saying your way is wrong, you know, change to my way. This is just one way. But definitely, I think that students have more success when they learn things maybe a little bit more intensely and more like detail oriented correctly the first time, as opposed to just like vomiting the show onto the field and then going back and cleaning it all up. You know, um, I don't know how your circuit works. Like for us, you know, when we start competing, nobody's done. You know, nobody's done. You know, we have like a, a three minutes or five minutes, you know, and I'm not sure how long your shows have to be. Ours have to be six at the scholastic level, obviously way longer than DCI. But um, so, you know, we try to program all of our shows to be six minutes and one second, basically, and, you know, less to clean. Um, but it, it really just kind of depends on what time of year you're in and what your philosophy is. But I would definitely try and kind of compartmentalize as you're learning, especially. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah, thank you very much. Great, great. Cool, any other questions before we move on to the next slide? Yeah, and keep in mind, if you have questions about other things not related to this, I'm happy to talk about it when we're all done. You know, I kind of, I kind of like just to chat at the end, you know, get the formal stuff out of the way. I'll fly through it. Hold on one second. All right. Oh my goodness. 
There we go. Next, the necessary tools. So now obviously budget and money is a thing you know, where not all of us have as much of it. I, I, I will feel very safe in saying this. None of us have as much as we need. <laughs> you know, none of us are given the budgets from whoever we get it from, um, you know, where we, you know, band is expensive. Um, but these in a perfect world, and if you can make this happen, um, metronome, drumsticks, tuners, scores, individual parts. The metronome is just, it's huge. Um, I've worked, um, I've kind of seen the, um, the evolution of using the metronome on the field. When I first started, when I first was a member in band and drum corps, we didn't have like Dr. B hooked up to a long ranger or up to a Vox, you know, beep, beep, beep. we didn't have that. We, we either had nothing or we had like a band director in the middle of the field with a gawk block. I remember when I was marching Blue Devils, when I was a member of Blue Devils, so this is 1995, we did not use a metronome. We had, our drum major had a hat on and a little, little handheld metronome tucked into the hat so he could hear it beep in his ear and a gawk block. And this is the Blue Devils. We won a championship that year. Uh, it's, it, it's crazy to me. And now we have click tracks that can do a child rondos, that can do all Rondo type stuff. And it's a really, really fantastic tool. If you don't have tonal energy, raise your hand if you have tonal energy. Okay. I would recommend everyone getting tonal energy. It's $3 on your phone. Um, let me show you. I, I can actually kind of just show it to you. So it looks like this. Uh, it's, it's a metronome and a tuner. And what's cool about this metronome is that you can program in your tempos for your show. You can, you can make click tracks for the entire show. So every single time, there is, there is a little bit of a learning curve for getting that all programmed but it's an inexpensive, highly effective tool. And just so um, it does have its limitations. The limit, one main limitation is how loud this beeps over a Vox compared to a Dr. B. It is not as loud. We actually, me and Ryan Williams, my assistant at Blue Stars, we actually contacted the people that developed this app. We're like, you need to do an update where this thing beeps louder. Because it's funny, if you, walk, if you watch like, a, like the Blue Stars doing a brass block, like we'll be on the field. And if we're working like a mezzo forte section, we'll have the tonal energy in. But when we start blowing, we have to switch metronomes because it's not loud enough. The kids can't hear it. You know? um, now, obviously, that's for a drum corps horn line. Like my high schools, we don't have that problem. <laughs> we don't have the problem where the kids can't hear that. Um, but it's a great tool. So like um, you can also, one thing that I really, really like about this is that you can drone. You can drone and have a met going. So like when I'm doing long tones, I'm droning. When I'm doing corral playing, I'm droning and I have a met going. So I highly encourage all of you to invest the $3 or I don't know what it is over there, pounds um, and, and what it is, but I highly recommend you getting this. This is an amazing tool. And I have almost everyone in my junior high band with this on their stand while they're playing. Now it's, I'm not supposed to let them use their cell phones during school time, but you know, I just have to monitor that. But this is a fantastic tool. Um, but um, if you don't have like a Vox where you can, you know, Bluetooth, you know, hook up your phone or just get an aux cable and hook up. You at least want to have this going with some sticks or with a stick and a gawk block. So you're running everything at the correct tempo. Even if you're running things a bit slower, we want to make sure that we're giving the kids a nice steady click to play with. Because at the end of the day, what we do is all about muscle memory. And, it, and it's ingrained. Yeah, there we go. I'm assuming that's a pound sign and a 2.18. There you go. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever that means. You, you all, you all do that. But, um, but, and I just lost my train of thought. No, um, when you're, when you're running, you want to make sure that we have a metronome at all times. 
Because honestly, if you're running things without a metronome and the tempo is kind of fluctuating, you're kind of doing yourself and your students a disservice. Uh, that, that muscle memory needs to be ingrained at that tempo, the correct tempo from very, very early on. Let's see what else we got. What other tools? Just, yeah, pop in, yeah. Um, so with, with using a metronome, is that just for when you're indoors or would you use that outdoors? Like, is it just start of the season or would you use it all the way through? All like, like whenever I have band directors that, have, that are hesitant to use the metronome, they're like, well, we have to learn how to play without it. Of course we do. But I will say the, the best marching ensembles in the world, the Blue Devils, the Blue Stars, Carolina Crown, they are doing reps on DCI finals day at practice with the metronome. Right. It never completely goes away. Now, if you want strategies for how to use the metronome, we can talk about that for a long time. But I will, I'll briefly say this, in sectionals, it's got to be behind your kids. That's why the Bluetooth, like Vox, is the brand of the speaker. Uh, and if, if you can get it, it is so great. You have it behind your kids, the tempo's going, you're droning your concert B flat or your concert F. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Now, when you're on the field, there's a lot of different ways to use the metronome. Um, I'm a big believer in... You know, we, you know, we've got two drum majors. If you've got two drum majors, um, one's going to be conducting and one's going to be carrying that metronome around all season long. I always ask my brass player kids that want to be drum major. I'm like, why do you want to carry a metronome? Why don't you want to play your instrument? You know, but, but it's, it's a very, very important job. Um, a lot of people use the metronome incorrectly. Um, yeah, there you go. Got some recommendations on some equipment. Um, a lot of people use the metronome incorrectly. So if you, if your trumpet section is playing like a little technical passage and the drum line is like, let's say 25 yards away, you know, that they're not going to have that, um, nice steady tempo source that they can just listen to. You know, they're obviously going to be having to really trust their eyes and probably, you know, play, you know, maybe slightly ahead or whatever. I don't met those sections on the field as much. I will in the beginning of the year while they're getting comfortable, but um, but a lot of times, like even in DCI, and I won't mention any names or any years, but one year recently with one of the drum corps I taught, they really grossly used the metronome incorrectly. And if you listen to the recording at finals, the, the drum corps was not ensemble very tight. And it's super disappointing. Like when you go through your whole season and you listen to that recording and you're just like, man, we never quite got it. You know, and, um, and a lot of that can be just from things that as a staff we're doing incorrectly. We, we, our intentions are good, but it's just not a common sense approach. So if the drum line is in the back of the field, like you should met everything every time because they're going to have well, assuming that your drum line can play in time, you know, um, but they're going to have that temper, tempo source behind them to listen to, you know. So does that make sense? So if there's no, like, in the show, like, battery presence, I, I met those sections a lot less because they do need to be become more trusting in their eyes and lining their feet up with the hands. And, and honestly, a lot of times people in DCI, they don't like to do that because they don't like to hear their horn line sound like shit, quite frankly. You know, and, and your horn line or your band, if you take the metal away during one of those sections, they're not going to sound good for a while. And you've got to be okay with that. You know, you, you've got you've to be okay with that and trust that your students are going to figure it out. And, that's, um, and it's something that I call the light bulb moment. Because every every kid has that moment where the light bulb, where the marching band light bulb flashes above their head, and they understand it, and their feet are in time, and they're playing well. But a lot of kids never get there. I, I I've had a lot of high school kids never get there. They're wonderful kids. I love them. I would never kick them out. I would, I love having them, but they they never fully get it. Any other questions about that? But I mean, and if you don't have a strong tempo source, if you don't have drumsticks don't have a sectional just just wait you know or do something else yeah it, it's 
it's that important, I believe. Another thing um, that I wanted to mention, and I'm just pulling my, um, we've got a question. Clive, if you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to add, with the, with the tonal energy, one of the things that I find really useful, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Yeah, one of the things I find really useful about the tonal is because you can use it on Bluetooth. Yeah. You have the power amp, for example, at the front or the back or somewhere on the rehearsal. You've got that handheld in your pocket. You're walking yep. around doing stuff. You can start the Met, turn it off, turn it on, whatever you like from your pocket. Yeah. Whereas what I found with other things is that you have to run back to the front. So therefore there's a delay to turn the Met off. So you yeah. cause a little bit of unnecessary background noise and a little bit of disturbance. And again, you have to set it going and then is it eight count or is it wait for me to count you in? But yeah. put that in your hand, you can control it from anywhere you are within that um, that ensemble situation. Yeah, that's that's it's, uh, the Bluetooth, like tech, like te all these all these technological tools that we have. They're awesome. They're awesome, but they're just tools. Like you have to figure out, like Clive was saying, the ways to like make that work in your situation. You know, like the the tonal energy. It's an awesome tool, but if you're not using it correctly, you know. And, and Clive, it sounds to me like you are, you know, like it's, it's something that saves him time. It's something that makes sure that his kids are getting correct tempo sources. And also like, so there's been times where I've been out on the field and like, we're um, at a night rehearsal and that's cooling off. I'll just drone a concert F over the Bluetooth speaker and be like, uh, everyone, please do something. Please get in tune, please. You know, and, and he's right. It's like, I'm in the stands controlling that. A lot of times we have the drum major, uh, that extra drum major control it, but you can certainly control it too. And I, and I have done that in the past. There's my wife. Hi. <laughs> Say hi to everyone. There you go. There you go. The lovely Mrs. Larson. Um, great. Um, um, we'll yeah. We've got a question from Dale as well, just asking if you could talk a bit about droning. Droning, sure. Um, like I do, like for example, I don't drone a lot with my elementary students. Like I I feel that um, intonation, there's a lot of things, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how to get your ensemble to play in tune. And I think the approach that I take is a little bit different and a lot of it involves droning. Um, Obviously, when we're tuning, I've got concert F going or concert B flat, depending on what we're tuning to. Um, if I'm doing um, Remingtons, I'm certainly droning. Um, if I'm doing lip slurs, I might just do the first key, you know, and drone the and drone a concert B flat or whatever key it's in. Um, but I focus more on finding your perfect sound. And what I mean by that is, you know, you know that feeling like when you put your instrument up and you've been warming up for about 10 minutes and you play a concert F at like mezzo piano and it's just like, man, I sound really good right now. I sound good. You know, this, I, feel, I feel really comfortable. That is what I try to get my students to is that feeling of comfort where they have resonance because so often when we hear our kids play out of tune, we go right to that tuning slide and it's really a waste of time, I think. The first question that I ask my students, okay, first of all, if you're playing out of tune, if you think you're playing out of tune, you prob you're right, you probably are. Because a lot of them will be like, am I out of tune? I'm like, if you think you are, you are. Now, what's the next step? I, and I ask them, I'm like, what do we, what's the first question you ask yourself if you think you're out of tune? And that question is, am I playing with my best sound? If I'm not playing with my best sound, my tuning slide is going to do absolutely nothing for me. You know, I don't know, I, I'm assuming that you guys deal with some extreme weather. I do, we do band in 115 degrees. So we like, we tune to 442 and we're like 30 cents sharp. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy, but we get a lot more success with focusing on producing great characteristic tone. If you play with a great sound, great characteristic tone, you're gonna be close. You're gonna be close. 
And then we just fine tune. And that's why at the drum corps, like at all the drum corps I've taught, at Blue Devils, Cadets, and Boston, which were all with Gino Cipriani, we did the tuning mark system. I do not recommend tuning marks for young performers. Like, because everyone's different, everyone's developing. And also often everyone's on different instruments. But like when I get my, when I go to the Blue Stars and I've got 24 trumpets all on brand new Yamaha Zeno trumpets. It's pretty sweet, you know, and I can put marks on that. These are all great players. They're all in the same mouthpiece. They're all in the same horn. If we put them to a mark that's appropriate for the temperature that we're in, we're gonna be close because they have great characteristic tone. If they didn't, we could not do that. Now droning helps them find that, that nice sound. And it also like, um, it's sort of an instinctive thing and it takes time. Um, I've noticed with a lot of my brass ensembles, when, they, when I drone with them a lot early on, they, they slowly, but by the end of the season, they just have a sort of an instinctful feeling for that concert F. So, but, but that, that's how I use it. And, it, you know, certainly if you're at your concert or you're at your competition and you got a kid that's 25 cents sharp and you're about to walk on the field, have them pull the tuning slide out. But if you're in rehearsal, I would really, really encourage you to, we're playing, we're playing out of tune right now. Let's focus on tone. You know, let, let's focus on that. Let, let, let's drone a concert F and play nine count concert Fs for ever, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's, that's what I would, that's what I would do. Any other questions about like tools, technology, equipment? I do want to bring, I brought it up earlier. I was talking to Mary about it. Um, does anyone in here have smart music, have access to smart music? No? Man, it's like smart music, and especially this year in 2021 for DCI is, I mean, every single year that I've taught the last six seasons, we've increased our use of smart music. Um, it's really tough on the kids, but when you've got kids coming from all over the country and, and you know, like we have blue stars we have kids from from the uk you know that are one kid that that flies over and um you know it's um what heard about smart music the uh eric combs oh, i don't know who that is yeah but smart music is just an assessment tool it's a practice tool it's a tool and um you can assign excerpts to your kids and they can play into a microphone and the, the software will give it a grade a percentage grade. Um, and it's basically just to make sure that when kids walk in the room, all notes and rhythms are learned, at least base level understanding. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done, even if you've got 100% on smart music from all your students. But um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that if you guys don't really have access to it. Yeah, Megan, she's freaking fantastic. Love Megan. She's awesome. Yeah, when we... That, that little girl is one of the best marchers I've ever seen. She's astoundingly good visually. And most of the time, especially when I was at Boston, they're really hesitant to work with kind of shorter performers because, because of the demand, you know, because of the demand, but she is awesome. Um, I just saw her on a call the other day. Um, cool. And what's that? I just said she is pretty short too, isn't she? <laughs> she's so short, <laughs> but but she's she. I mean, she she had one of the one of our highest visual auditions. I have no chance. <laughs> well, everybody's got a chance, and but like honestly, like when um, I had a mellophone player at Boston yeah. for three years, and the girl was five two. The girl was five two. She was the best marchand player on the field. Amazing amazingly talented and the Vish staff wanted to cut her and I'm like are you out of your mind look at this kid she's like they're like well she's not tall I'm like who cares but they they still wanted to get rid of her and we saved her we saved her but all right cool I'm gonna move on unless there's any other questions about like tools technology we can talk more about it later too just want to get through this presentation just so we can kind of talk about these little you know more specific um, topics that you guys come across that maybe you need a little help with. Let's see. So great. I, I love talking about this, the power of your words. 
look, like music teachers love to talk, don't we? I mean, we, you know, we're, uh, most of us, you know, are, you know, we're, we're personable people. We like to communicate with our students. Sometimes we just talk too much, <laughs> especially early season. So the light bulb moment we talked about, that light bulb moment that I'm talking about is when a kid physically feels what it's like to do it right. Now, our job is to get all of our kids to the light bulb moment as fast as possible. Words very seldomly get them there. What they have to have that kind of epiphany inside their mind and they have it through doing it over and over again. The three most powerful words I believe in a music, a music teacher's arsenal are do it again or one more time or let's do, let's run that again. Good job again. Okay, great. Do it again. Do it again. You've got to be willing to run it one more time. You know, and a lot of times music teachers will move on because they're bored. Not because the students are bored, but because they're bored. Uh, I just ran this thing 25 times. Well, you may need 26. You've got to be willing to hang in there and do it one more time. Now, that being said, that being said, I had a really, really great teacher and um, great trombone teacher in college. And he was an amazing band director. He conducted the Army Field Band uh, while uh, Ronald Reagan was president. Amazing. And um, I used to talk to him about, I believe in repetition. I believe that's the most important thing, blah, 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 blah. And he was, he gave me this snide, like, just like, like condescending look, just like, I, like he was disgusted with me. And he gets up and he conducted the wind ensemble. He's like, all right, everyone, we're going to play To Tame the Perilous Skies 10 times in a row because Travis thinks that repetition is the way to get this done. And I was like, you're such a jerk, you know, but, but he's right. It's not always that, especially early season. So a lot of times you got to remember, all right, we're two weeks into this process. My standard, we may not hit the standard today, but are we on the way to the standard? You, know, you got to kind of do those mental gymnastics on your own, you know, figure out what time of the year is it? Where are my kids at? I need to get them to slightly better than they are now or marginally better than they are now. You know, but if we're not getting there after 25, 26 reps, maybe it's just not time. So you have to kind of walk that tightrope and you will. And after you kind of do, you, you know, your ensemble is a hell of a lot better than I do. I don't know them at all. You know, you could be, you could say, well, you know what, Travis, I do think I run things like 10 times and like, I can see in my kid's eyes that they look helpless and they're not going to get it. So is it a good idea to just like beat the dead horse, you know, and just run it for an hour? No, it's not. It's not. But you also need to know the time where your kids are just kind of mm, not hitting the standard because they're mentally not engaged or just not really you know, motivated. And that's, you know, you got to know, all right, I need to push my kids here and get them to uh, a higher standard. So it's kind of, you know, repetition. I highly believe in early season, talk less, rep more. I remember Gino Cipriani walked, walked up to me after a mellophone sectional a couple years ago. And he's like, you know why I like you so much? I'm like, why is that? And he's like, because you shut up and just rep it. And, and I'm a big believer in that. All right, what else do we got? Any questions on that? On like reps and yeah. I mean, we're all, we all teach band. We like to rep things. If we didn't like to rep things, we would have you know gone into sales or something. All right, let's pull this back up. Yeah, and, and, and obviously your words can be very powerful um, to encourage uh, to encourage your students or to kind of kick them in the butt a little bit, which is necessary at times. But honestly, um, for a long time, when I first started teaching in the 90s, it was all about negativity and it was all about just, just, yelling and, 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 and like, you know, we got, we got, we got to get this, you know, I was a tyrant, you know, I would, I would throw shoes down on the, 
And very quickly, very quickly, I figured out this is not, I was not a teacher. I was a drill sergeant and not even a good one. So I'm like, I'm not even teaching my students. I'm, I'm, I'm intimidating them into not wanting to make a mistake. Now, is that the type of environment that we all want for our programs? I don't think so. I certainly don't. So every program I work with, it's all about positive reinforcement, but, but there is a standard for everything. And if they aren't hitting it, they are going to hear about it. They're going to hear about it. And it won't always be pleasant, but it will always be about hitting the standard. It won't be about an individual. Why aren't you doing this right? Why can't you double tongue this thing in time? What's the matter with you? You know, as opposed to, man, let's, let's come up with a strategy for how we can make you double tongue faster. Let's slow it down. You know, or let's, let's, um, let's come up with an exercise that, you know, really accentuates the second syllable in our double tongue. You know, like, let's do this. You know, something that you're doing together with your student, not beating them down emotionally. Um, kids nowadays, they're not, they don't put up with that shit. They really don't like, like our drum corps kids. I mean, I'm sure you all have like read a lot of articles and seen, you know, what's going on with member safety and like the well being of our members in DCI. And I mean, I didn't really need a press release to tell me that I need to treat my students with respect, you know, and, and, and that's what it's all about. It's, it's a relationship, you know, at, at the DCI level, it's, it's obviously a different relationship than I have with my fifth grade students, you know, but it's very much about, you know, mutual respect, understanding, and trying to empower each other, you know, so make sure that, especially when they're not hitting the standard, you're being encouraging, you know, it's okay if you sense that kind of, you know, like, that like mediocrity in your, like you, you can tell your kids aren't giving it their all. Let's go guys. What we're not hitting. Is this, is this who we are? You know, it, it, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to yell. Uh, it's very easy to yell when you're frustrated, especially when they're not getting it right. I, I, I just encourage you for not just for your members, but for you, man, I would go home and just be like, shit, I cannot, uh, why aren't these kids doing this right? I was so frustrated. And now, since, and, and since I kind of shifted that, it's like, well, well, it's, it's a much more relaxed and happy experience as an educator to be encouraging and to be respected by your students, not feared by your students. All right, any questions on that? Something I forgot to talk about when we were talking about identity. So, I like to give an actual name, like an identity to who I'm working with. Like if I'm working with the Mountain View High School brass section, which I have been now for six years. My first year there, they'd, they'd had another guy for years. They were pretty good, not great. I walked in there and I'm like, what's your school's mascot? They're like, it's the Toros. And I'm like, great, we're Toro brass. And all I have to do with those kids now, not initially, but now, is if they have a bad rep, I just go, was that, is, is that Toro Brass? Like, is that what we do at Toro Brass? Is that how we play at Toro Brass? And they go, no, and we do it again. There's an identity attached to the standard. And it's just, it's, it's, it's not a mind game, but it, I guess it kind of is, it's just a little mind game. Like, you know, Toro Brass is, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and we've been doing this at a high level for a long time. Is that Toro Brass? And they all just kind of go, no, it's, it's not. That's not what we want our identity to be. So that's, that's something that I, I use a lot. And it's a way that you can sort of discourage certain behaviors in your kids without pointing at them individually. Trumpets, is that Toro Brass? You know? you know, lead trumpets. Is that really how we sound? Is that what we do? As opposed to Johnny, you suck. What's your problem? You know, it's, it's, it's the same message, but delivered in a very, very different way that will help you with your students. I don't want to forget that. Um, let me see. I, I think we're almost done. Let me just pull up this. I think I only got like one more slide. Couple more slides. 
Yeah, consistency. Consistency, and I, and I put the light bulb moment here. As you can see, I kind of, I'm all over the place, but um, the, the approach to sectionals with your staff, it should be in line with your vision, not your staff member's vision. You know, let's say you have this really great, you know, low brass, you know, instructor that, you know, March Kids Grove and is good player, smart kid, comes into your program and wants to run everything the way that he does it or she does it. That, that's not going to jive. You know, that's not going to work. You need to make sure that your staff is subscribing to your vision. And, and, and the tone and the style of, of rehearsals should be similar across your ensemble. You know, I've been a part in, of programs where there's been bitterness within members brought up because, well, the woodwinds don't work as hard as we do. You know, or the percussion, they're in the shade. You know, or the, the color guard instructor gives them water breaks every five minutes. You know, those conversations I feel need to be had as a staff before the season. You know, this is who we are. This is my vision. You know, every sectional needs to be this long. During those sectionals, this is the type, this is the way that our wind players stand. We don't sit on the ground and play. You know, we, we all stand the same way. We bring our horns up the same way. You know, we, we get eight from the Met on count five, we snap our horn up. We get eight from the Met in five, six, lock, we lock. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But it needs to be the same across all parts of your ensemble, in my opinion. I know a lot of really successful programs where the tone of rehearsal is very different. Um, most of those groups are more experienced performers. But when we're dealing with developing performers, I think that they it's important for them all to feel that the experience that they're having is pretty, pretty universal across the ensemble. Um, you know, again, uh, that's an opinion of mine, uh, not necessarily, um, you know, what you have to do. Let's see what else we got here on this slide. The light bulb moment, we talked about it. Um, you know, how are we going to get them there? How do we stand? How do we set up the arc? Do we put our water jugs in the arc or do they go behind? Do we put a music stand in front of us? You know, you wanna be as uniform as possible. I think as um, marching band directors, we, most of us do a really good job at that. You know, and, and that's a big part of our culture is, is how we structure and how we physically look do it during our rehearsal time and during our performance time, uh, how we carry ourselves like when we're waiting for the awards. I think that most band directors do a great job I'm kind of having a culture and a vision for that. If you don't, I would recommend that you do. Um, that, that arc setup, or you know, if you do double arcs, or if you do a circle, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just figure out what that is and have it, have it done that way across your ensemble. I want to talk about this, simulation of performance conditions. <laughs> so I, like, I'm the guy that, you know, let's talk a little, so best horn line in the world, Carolina Crown, right now, probably. You know, they get in a circle, they, you know, Matt Harlov wrote a book called Inside the Circle, um, and, and they do their thing. Here's, and it works for them. Here's my thing. When are we ever in a circle facing each other in our show? Never, most likely. When are we in a concert arc at one and a half step intervals in the show? Never, never. Now, does that mean that we don't do a circle or we don't do a concert arc? No, no, that doesn't mean that. But should we stand in it for an hour while we warm up and do technique every day? Or maybe should we try some different listening situations for our students? I'm a big believer that the answer to that question is yes. Um, I do a couple of things. Um, with high schools, with my high school brass sections, which I think is more kind of your, um, like what you guys are working with, I do what's called a blend and, balance, blend and balance scatter. I start in an arc, I do arcs, only, I, I don't, I used to do circles, I do arcs now. I, I don't know why, I just do. Um, but 
we'll do like some long tones, we'll do some stuff. And then I just have them get into a scatter formation in front of me. I step back from them, it's intermixed, and we'll play some long tone type stuff and chorale type stuff. And what we're doing is we're simulating a performance situation because the kids are more often sort of around each other, not in a arc form like that, you know? Um, you know, they're not scat in a scatter formation a lot, but what this does is when you step back and you get that map going and you're playing your corral, like I do old hundredth with all my high schools, it's, you know, it's great corral. Um, and not only are we working on our good tone and our timing and our feet, feet timing, we're working on blending balance. We're, if you have a, if you have a brass staff or if you have a woodwind staff, you have like three people, just have them wander around the formation and listen for those lovely sounds. I don't know if you guys have field judges um, in your circuit, do you? Do they wander out on the field or do they do the DCI thing and just hang out on the front sideline? They wander around the field. Even more reason for you to do a blend and balance scatter and wander around the formation and find those bells. Find those kids that just don't get the whole playing balanced and blended, <laughs> you know? Uh, that, uh, that are vomiting through their horn. Um, you can wander around the formation and sample a lot of individual bells that way. Uh, if you have the Met, you don't necessarily need a conductor, you know, for every exercise. Uh, at Blue Stars, uh, we have taken that kind of to a different level. We are setting up multiple formations in our warm up. We start in an arc, every exercise is on the move. Every exercise. When we do buzzing, we're taking a small forward stride, doing a backward stride, halting, doing that. When we're playing our long tones, we're, we're moving our feet and moving forward, moving back. And then we'll get into our blend and balance scatter. Um, we, uh, in that blend and balance scatter, we do three corrals and we had the, um, the choreographer for the Blue Stars, Chris, uh, Chris Galbraith, he um, choreographed Base level, easy dance, like plie, you know, lunge that they do in the warm up every day while they're playing corrals. And it sure did sound awful when we first did it. But as we did it more, not only like you start, like we are constantly moving while we're playing, right? Like if it's not marching, it's choreo. You got to get that involved in your warm up process. Um, and that's a way that you can simulate a performance situation right there is by putting them in a different formation. We also put them in three straight lines. So you're dealing with people on the ends having to kind of, you know, being, you know, how often do you get that baritone player that comes around the end of a form, you know, and their bell is super exposed. This gets them kind of thinking of, on their side to side listening responsibilities, you know, in a straight line, they're covering a lot more distance. We do our double tonguing exercise in three long straight lines. It sounds like shit, but they're, they, through the process, it gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, more clear, more clear, more clear, you know, and it, it, it works because they're simulating that situation that, you know, most of the time in warm up arc, we, we don't, we don't put, we don't ask our performers to, to kind of be in situations that they're at in the show. So I encourage you to do that. Another since you have field judging, um, when I do my uh, full brass sectionals, which is one day a week at the, I, I use my Mountain View brass section as an example. It's just the brass section out on the field with me and a Met, and we move and play. We move and play. So if we're doing something and the trumpets have a bad rep, let's say the trumpets have a bad rep, I'll be like, all right, low brass, get some water. Trumpets, we're gonna run that a few times. When that water breaks over, I have the baritone line or in the rest of the horn line, stand right in front of them before they're about to do a rep. I'll be like, hey, and I don't say anything. I just say, hey, everyone, check out the trumpets. And they walk over and they stand in front of the trumpets and the trumpets do a performance of whatever excerpt we're working on. And the power of that, the power of their peers standing in front of them is it's, it's just as nerve wracking as standing in front of a judge, you know? And I've had directors tell me, well, you could really start to have kids arguing with each other, pointing fingers at each other. 
And I'm like, no, I won't. Because I let them know from day one, every day, this is a positive, you know, we're all in this together. Any sort of like the trumpets suck, they're out. Goodbye. Goodbye. You know, maybe maybe a warning, but negativity, negativity and disrespect just doesn't even exist because it's ingrained in their culture. So the kid, and I just if the Trumpets do their rep in front of the baritone line. I, I just get on the mic, go to the baritones. I just go, is that Toro Brass? And they'll say yes or no. And if they say no, I have them do it again. You know, it's, it's, again, it's simulating a performance situation. And it really, really, really makes those, it, it puts them on their mental game. They don't, wanna, they don't wanna sound bad in front of their peers. And again, it's all a part about that culture we were talking about, about being prepared and being highly accountable. No accountability. I mean, there's there's no better measure of accountability than having them play in front of their friends, you know, their teammates, their peers, the people that they're you know fighting for, you know, a championship with, you know, or whatever. But um, I'm a big believer in that and creating those situations so when they get to the field, they're comfortable. You know, they know that someone's gonna wander in front of them. You know, they know that that judge is going to be out there. They, you know, they're used to playing in front of people. The audience just becomes not even a factor for them. They don't even care because they're used to being put in those kind of high leverage um, positions. Any questions on that? I'm about done. And then we can just kind of open it up. Hold on a second. I have got a question, but it's not really about what you just spoke about. Okay. Um, so with with DCI, obviously, there's the age limit of 21, isn't there? So mm -hmm. your members are sort of like 18 to 21 age. Is that about? Yeah, like, um, you know, with with DCI, especially top 12, you know, yeah. you know um, you're dealing mainly with college kids, mainly. Uh, you do have gifted high school performers. But quite frankly, like um, my last year at Boston, which was 19, when we did the Goliath, um, my last year there, um, we, we were extremely hesitant to take any high school kids. You know, um, we had kind of built the brass program up there the previous two years to, you know, where we had, you know, I think we had about 500 kids audition for Boston in 2019. Um, we didn't have a ton of spots, so we were able to be pretty picky and we didn't pick any high school kids. And, and there were, and, and honestly, like for us, um, and it's the same way with the Blue Stars too. Like we'll take a 19 year old kid that's done a drum corps tour before over a 17 year old phenom, you know, because we know that that kid can make it down the road. Cause not all kids can, you know, like every year, every single year, we have at least three or four kids quit during spring training. Cause they can hang. I, and, and honestly, I don't know if I could hang. Like when I was 17, it was way different. They, we work these kids so hard and they love it. They're, they're, they're insane. They're a different breed of kid, but they rehearse 14 hours a day for 30 straight days. Jeez. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's trash when they walk in and it's a polished Corvette when, when we drive out, you know, because the way that the activity works now, the way that it's adjudicated, um, you got to be really good at the first show. If you want to be successful, you really got to implant that um, that really good first impression and like the brass judges. I mean, those are the only ones I care about. I don't care about visual and GE. That's somebody else's job. But like those brass judges, they get an idea in their head about who's the best and where you fit in there. And it's tough to change their mind. It's tough to change their mind. Even when we get to talk to them every night, you know, we, we go to critique and we talk to them and we try to plead our case, but often the, the brass numbers and even the placements don't really change that much after the first few weeks. They do sometimes, you know, but it's, and I think it's different with, with high school. Like you, you don't see the same judges over and over and over again, typically, at least not where I'm at. Um, you know, they kind of have a different panel, you know, you chat with them for five minutes at the end of the show. It's totally different. So, and, and, and obviously the, the goals are just not even in the same universe for, you know, what we're trying to do with like the blue stars, you know, we're, we're trying to get into the top six, you know, we're trying to knock down 
someone that's been a world champion, you know? So it's, you know, the, the, the set of goals and everything that goes into how we get to that is completely different than what we would do with a high school program, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your questions, but. So sort of. I was just going to say like with Bieber, our age limits up to 25, oh. and you're also a few overage members as well. So we're, in terms of setting the standard and stuff, we're seeing people who've marched for 10, 15 years next to a six-year-old who's just picked up a trumpet for the first time. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any tips for that sort of thing. Well, I mean, I don't have any experience with that wide, but I'll, I'll say this, like when you teach elementary band, like there is a wide spectrum of ability. And, and I mean, when you teach anywhere, you know, any scholastic like school type of situation and the drum corps, they're all great. Maybe you have one kid that's only sort of great, you know, but he's great, you know, she's great. Where with the high school, you, you know, there's always just this wide spectrum of ability. Now, um, I think you just have to be kind of instinctive about where, you, um, where you've been and where you wanna go and kind of how they sound, you know, collectively and kind of make the standard around that. Now, obviously it, it's gonna help you out a lot if you have the time to spend some individual time with that less experienced performer, but you also gotta make sure that your, um, your uh, technique routine, uh, your warm up routine is, is catered towards, you know, developing you know, developing all those things. You know, my technique program at the Blue Stars, you know, yeah, do we do Remingtons? Yeah, do we do long tones? Yeah, but it's all like, once we get past that, it's all harder stuff. Because we're trying to take them from a high level to an even higher level, where with my high schools, and I'm gonna share this with you, I have like three exercises that I do. Three exercises and a corral. And that's it. And, and the exercises are not complicated. They're not hard. They're meant for developing performers. And I'm actually going to show that to you guys in a few. Um, but uh, yeah, let me just get, I, I have like one more slide and then we can just yeah. chat. Let's see what we got here. All right, simulation. Oh, that's it. But I do want to say this. Um, can you all write down my email? Um, write down my email. It's brass at bluestars.org. If you shoot me an email, I will send you a packet with three exercises for free in PDF format. Uh, it's a long tone exercise that we do at Blue Stars called meditation. It's not a Remington exercise. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, it's uh, a fun exercise. Uh, and then I just have a an exercise that's a two note lip slur for brass players, but a scale pattern exercise that goes along with it for woodwinds, if you have woodwinds. And then um, there's a chromatic exercise as well, a fun chromatic exercise. Um, but if you shoot me an email, um, I will get that over to you. Um, the, the call that we're on right now is being recorded if you ever wanna refer back to it. I won't have it probably uploaded in, in, into Luke's hands until tomorrow night or possibly even Monday, but we, I will get it to you. Um, Let's chat. What's going on? What like what can I help you guys with? Um, I've got know. a bit of a question, if that's okay. Who's that? Uh, Pete. Okay, sure. Um, I think one of the things for us, uh, I was really pleased to hear you talk about culture and consistency. Uh, one of the challenges I think quite a lot of British corps have is we've got an entirely voluntary staff um, structure and quite different ideas there some people thinking very much of a hobbyist type thing whereas others saying actually i'm a staff member i've got responsibilities i just don't get paid for it yes. and i just thought if, wondered if you've got any thoughts about the best ways we can manage that sort of thing <laughs> many i have many thoughts about it um um yes absolutely high schools out here um arizona is not like texas or indiana where, which are, are like meccas for these massive band programs we have smaller developing programs and we do not have a local state government that supports the arts i mean so our budgets are very very low we need to lean on our alumni members to come back and volunteer their time and yes do we have some of them that think it's just a really great idea for them to hit on some junior color guard girl yes or, or it, it, we very quickly identify the people that are not there for the betterment of the program 
that are there for the betterment of themselves and we get rid of them. We get rid of them. They're counterproductive. They're not, they're, they're not going to, a conversation will certainly be had. Also, like if you're leaning on alumni, I'd wait a couple of years after they're done to let them back in. Um, we don't let our high school kids um, at most programs I work at until they're 21. You know, give them a couple of years, get them detached from the program, detached from all those relationships, those close relationships they have, you know, that can, you know, and, and it's just as much to protect them as it is to protect our students and, and, and the director and staff. But I would get rid of them or just have a very long chat with them about this is, I understand you're not being paid, you're volunteering, you are here in service of these members, in service of this ensemble. And if you don't feel like serving, that's fine. There's the door. So that, I, mean, I think black and white, you don't want to work, go do something else. Because quite frankly, what are you losing if you ask them not to come around anymore? They're not really doing anything for you anyways. They're just screwing around. They're, they're being a distraction to your students. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I think the, that's really useful. I think the interesting thing for us is actually quite often it's the younger people, the alumni who come back after a few years who are fine. And yeah. it's some of the older, more experienced people oh, yeah. who are set in their ways and don't necessarily recognize a need to change. Yeah, I get it. I mean, life's too short to deal with that. You don't have the time to deal with that. You know, like any, anything that's taking you away from your students, like, like the, these people are here to help you to make your job easier, you know? And they're there for some reason. Find out what that reason is. Like, okay, well, you volunteered for my program. You don't wanna do what I'm saying. You don't wanna serve my students. You wanna be a distraction. What exactly are you, what was your goal by, by volunteering? You know, uh, maybe try to like kind of dig in a little bit and get to the kind of the, the root of, well, well, I just don't think what, what you do is right. Great, get out, <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's how I would do it. I know that uh, Dale has raised his hand a couple of times. Did that answer your question, Pete? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got, Kinda. it's to do with our unique situation and that yeah. kind of applies and I, I'm on the same page as you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I know it can be tough to like turn your back on someone that's willing to come in and help. But you just have to ask yourself, are they really helping? Yeah. What's up, Dale? Hey, um, well, thank, first of all, thank you for today. Um, oh, no problem. Enjoy it. I'm having a blast. Yeah. I love this shit. I love talking about band. <laughs> we all do. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to. Um, I wanted. To, I wanted if you could um, reflect on probably um, the le I say the least able, the least competent group that that that, that you support. Um, and you know the way the band activity runs in the UK, and I'm certainly not speaking for everybody, but but I think it is is that we're we're, we're often we're not school based, um, so we're community based, and we're and we're providing a um, a wider service to the community than just a band. It's it's a you know um, it's a um, you can't mandate people to come there as part of a school program or anything along those things. I wonder what you did with your um, maybe your your um, I think you called them fifth to eleventh grade that sort of thing, which is probably where most of the people in the UK are at and that sort of fifth. I wonder what you did with those young people to keep it light um, when you felt that things were you know everything is you know we all enjoy a competition, but when you feel you need to lighten up a bit. I'm, I wonder what, how, what sort of stuff you do with your brass groups to keep when you feel you need to lighten up. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah with, with elementary band, you can't, you can't pound them. <laughs> you, you know, um, you definitely have to, and, and keeping it light is, is definitely a, a good way of putting it. Um, what I try, I just try to like with my younger students have like a, a couple of little activities that are fun, but are still based in playing. Like I'll put, like with my young brass players, like I'll put uh, a recording of like some pop song, song on and we'll buzz along with it. Or I'll do like a longest note contest with my fifth graders, you know, cause you know, like young brass players, they love to just take a little tiny sip of air, play for two counts and then breathe again. It really gets them, you know, kind of in a, it's, and they freaking love it. I have no idea why. I have my little stopwatch on my phone and I just go, okay, ready, go. And they play a concert effort as long as they can. And I tell them, I'm like, don't go to the darkness, you know, because a lot of them will start to like,
try to push themselves a little bit too far. I've never had anyone pass out, but something like that. And they just kind of giggle and laugh with my younger groups and my junior high as well. I, I try to save a few minutes at the end of the class period or the rehearsal where they can pack up and they can just enjoy being around each other and chat with each other. Now with the pandemic now, we have to stay distanced in our chairs, but um, but we're meeting, I mean, we're, the restrictions that I have right now are way less than you guys. I'm educating in person every day. Um, but I, I give them a few minutes just to be able to be around each other. Um, you know, I, I uh, supplement like, you know, rehearsal time with, you know, showing them a cool video, you know, of a great player or a great drum core. Um, but yeah, and, and also just sometimes I'll just, I'll just hang out and chat with the kids. I mean, like, it's, they want to feel like they're kind of connected to you in some way, you know, you're like the fig, their figurehead of this whole ensemble. Um, that That's really all I do. I, I, I'm not really like a super like, I don't do a lot of like team builders. Um, you know, I feel like um, being in the being in the whole, um, you know, and I have competition to point to. You know, uh, and most of the kids are motivated by competition, so I use that. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't do a ton of that. Like um, I know at um, I know at the drum course we do a bunch of like team building stuff at camps where they break into smaller groups and they do an activity. But um, I know that. Um, I'm trying to think. I know there's a resource that I've seen before that has like tons of cool little quick fun activities that you can do if like rehearsal's a little tense or maybe they just need a break. I I'll try and remember it and 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 reach out to you guys. But th that's what I do. Just a couple of little fun little things. But but yeah, I I know that the the that recruiting would probably be a big struggle like for for you all being independent organizations. Um, you know, fine, like kids now, I, I, and and American kids, all they care about is Instagram, TikTok, and I'm sure that the the young people in in England are pretty similar, you know. But I I try to like handle the recruiting thing and like and sort of the I don't know what's the word I'm looking for like the uh, morale type thing. And I use social media, you know, like I'll I'll post stuff and they they get to share it, you know. Like I post a video of the Blue Stars on Blue Stars Brass, you know, on our Facebook page and the kids get to share it, you know, and that's super exciting for them. It's not exciting for me at all, but it's exciting for them. And, and that, you know, that's something that you can do that can kind of, kind of hey, check out this video that, of us, you know, you can take time out of rehearsal to do that, to kind of light, lighten things up and it's still productive. But quite frankly, I'm not really like the touchy feely type of uh, teacher. I like to stay on task and because there's always so much to do but but yeah i, I hope that helped yeah, you, yeah thank you you kind of kind of asked me something that I, I should probably get better at you know quite frankly so anybody else where we anybody else it's not really about sectionals but sure if you had to pick one drum bar show and that's the only show you could ever watch again which <laughs> show would it be oh man um i i'm um i feel like 94 blue doubles is what changed the 94 blue doubles and 93 start of indiana is what changed the activity um from where it was to it was like the first step to kind of what it is now so i guess i would pick one of those and i marched blue doubles so 94 blue doubles like um that design team was just coming into their own and, and they're still together. Um, you know, that's Scott Chandler. Well, Wayne's gone. Wayne Downey doesn't, you know, isn't involved anymore, but Wayne wrote the brass book back then. But Scott Chandler, Wayne, and, and honestly, like Dave Glide, the, the percussion guy, he is the real genius behind the Blue Devils. Not a lot of people know that. Everyone thinks it's like Scott Johnson and, you know, and obviously Scott Chandler, the color guard designer for them is amazing. But, um, but uh, Dave Glide is the one that really crafts all the, the music that you hear from the Blue Devils, you know, and, and I think that show, um, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's called My Spanish Heart. It's all Chick Corea. It's all like great shit. It's awesome. It's Spanish Fantasy, uh, Day Dance, My Spanish Heart. And then uh, another part of Spanish fantasy, all from the 
amazing Chick Korea album, My Spanish Heart, which if you haven't heard that album, what are you doing? Go get it or go on Spotify. But that would be one that I would pick. My favorite horn line um, that I've taught was the 2015 Cadets when we did Power of 10 with the French horns. Um, I, I was the mellophone tech at the Cadets and that mellophone section was just beastly. And the reason why was we had, there's, we had 16 mellophones and 13 of them were vets. Five of them had been there for five years. So it was an incredibly experienced section. And I started with them in 2014 and beat the crap out of them all summer. I literally took five days off the whole summer. And then, and then 2015 was, you know, we won the brass trophy. When you beat Carolina Crown and the Blue Devils, it's a pretty good night. So it was awesome. And, um, but yeah, but I love the activity. Like I love all the old school stuff because I played on G Beagle, two valve um, G Beagles when I was in the Velvet Knights. I love all that stuff, but I love what the activity is about now. I love the fact that it, cre that it reinvents itself and morphs and has turned into something that is really, I think truly like, a, like an art form, you know, like, especially, you know, when you watch, you know, what, like what, what the top 12 drum corps are doing, it's, it's I, I can't even like fathom performing in one of those shows. I never could do it. I, I, I just marched and played, you know, so. Yeah, but yeah, I, 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 I'm a huge fan of this activity as we all are. That's why I'm involved in it, you know? And that's why I have worked so hard over the last year, even though we've done nothing really to just keep my kids as engaged as I can with Blue Stars, because like, I feel like we're really, really like in a dangerous time um, for what we do. And um, I would really just be absolutely devastated if, um, drum corps as we know it just kind of ceased to be so we're working really hard to make sure that doesn't happen yeah and a lot of times it's stuff that nobody sees you know so it's it's hard but but yeah you know didn't um didn't i thought that like the drum corps uk like was gone but it's back or it never left or i'm not too sure on the history of it all to be honest um, I, I thought it was gone for a while, or I thought that they folded it up, or I, I, I don't know, but I know with that the, with DCE Drum Corps Europe, where it's changed hands and then it's folded, and yeah. that's gone on quite recently. Okay. Uh, okay. But I I don't know my history. I'm not very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we got a new message in the chat. Uh, I think Warren's gonna have to shoot. Oh, off. he's got a bail. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Thanks for coming on. Shoot me an email. And it, for, for those exercises or any any questions that you think of, feel free to reach out. Anybody else have anything, any other questions or anything? Yeah, we got, I got two. Um, let's go Mary and then Stefan. Um, so in regards to like disabilities and stuff, do you, do you like, would you like make any adaptions for a disabled person? Like, are we talking about um, like people like like handicapped or more like like IEP, like like maybe some like neurological things or yeah, neural neural yeah, neurological. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Depending yeah. on um, the situation, um, definitely had a lot of kids. Um, with autism, lots. My son is autistic. So, you know, it's something that I um, care very much about is including everyone that I can. Um, I do SPED, uh, which is special ed out here. I don't know what they call it in England, um, but I do um, band with the special ed kids at the elementary. Um, I, I bring them in separately. I keep them all on percussion um, so they don't have to worry about um, you know, buzzing, you know, fingerings, they can just play auxiliary percussion or snare. Um, I do a lot of stuff with that. Now, have we had have we have kids on the spectrum, like in our high school programs? Absolutely. Um, I've had varying levels of success. It just depends on the kid. Um, I just try to have a lot of communication with the parents. 
Um, like I try to just really have a good idea for what's going to help them if they're having a bad day. You know, um, how can I treat them? What's it, how do I kind of, what's the most effective way to maybe remove them um, if they're having a bad day? Um, and what are some things that can help make them feel included? And what really, really goes a long way, um, at least out here, I mean, band kids are the best kids in the fucking world. I'm sorry, I cuss a lot. Um, but most of the most of the programs I work with, the, the band kids are so incredibly supportive to the special needs students that we have. They want them to be there. You know, they want them to feel included. Um, so I definitely enlist help of student leadership to make them feel, you know, part of the part of the group. Now, as far as they're playing, you know, a, a lot of kids that I've worked with that have um, some neurological stuff, they, they just, they can't play very well. But what they can do is they can learn a handful of notes where they play at the loud impacts. And that's usually what I do with them. And when I talk to the parents about that, I said, I'm not trying to take your kid out of anything. I'm trying to protect your child and let them be a part of something where they can feel successful. You know, and if you set the goals very realistic, they're gonna have enough to worry about with their visual responsibilities if they're a marching member. You know, a lot of times with kids with autism, like that we recognize early on, we put them in the front ensemble. Put them in the front ensemble, put them on, put them on a rack, put them on suspended symbol rolls, you know, and it's achievable things for them to help them feel included. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's very much a group effort, um, but it's, it's important. I, you know, to me, you know, we have drum corps. That's where if you want to be elitist and you want to have the best kid, kids, you can go to a drum corps, but band is for everybody. In, in my opinion, you know, and if you want to be in the band, you're in. No, that's, that's make it work. nice. That's nice to hear that. But um, I've been in quite a few bands in the past. And unfortunately, I've been a victim of disability discrimination. Yeah. Um, where basically I've been told, oh, you have a disability, you can't join because you have a disability. And that's, yeah. Well, that's a shame. Um, yeah, I, I just, like when I was, um, I was super, super fortunate just like throughout my entire, you know, um, student experience. I just, I had great teachers. Yeah, you know, I had great teachers. My high school band director was, was a, just a, a taskmaster but he had a big heart and every kid was, was allowed in. Um, I taught at the high school I graduated from and it was actually, I taught there with some pretty, like, like Jim Wonderlick who writes the brass book at Blue Stars, uh, Mike Jackson, who's the, was the percussion caption at Blue Knights. I worked with them for 15 years and they were like, well, we've got to audition. You know, they, they, and, and, and I wasn't, it's just a different viewpoint. It's not, I don't think it's right. But we have to have auditions, you know, they were very interested in having the program be super competitive. And so were we, but um, like we had a couple of kids that were just, you know, not quite as like cognitively, you know, gifted as some of the other kids, you know, but we, um, we made a place for them. And I did basically all those things that we said, I talked to the parents, I managed their parents' expectations, I managed the students' expectations that they were going to play the whole show um, and and tried to put them in a situation where they could be successful and a lot of times like we had one boy he didn't get it till the senior year but he got it and this was a competitive band program in the state of california you know we were very successful with a kid out there that had slow feet i mean really at the end of the at the end of the day if if you're someone who's kind of suffered you know a little bit of discrimination of that i mean is that the kind of ensemble you even really want to be a part of? I mean, so, you know, I'm sorry that you've experienced that, but hopefully you can find, you know, a home somewhere else. But that's what we, that's what we do. Like, we're not in the business of turning kids away, especially at the scholastic level. And that's not what we do. That's a great question. I've never, like, I, I've never had anybody ask me that in one of these. So that was cool. Well, and um, I know that Stefan had a question. 
Yeah, hi. Um, thank you very much for today. It's been very, very informative. As, um, as Dale touched on, we take our members from the community. So typically when they come to us, they've got no musical experience at all. So we're starting from the very, very basics. And I just wondered from your you know, background with the elementary schools and stuff like that, whether you had any tips on taking them sure. really from not being able to get a sound out of a mouthpiece to a, a you know, an acceptable level that they're going to enjoy playing. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. I mean, every year, you know, I get a new crop of fifth graders and it is a new challenge every year, you know, because I found that like one thing that I try to let the students know when they show up for the first time is I tell them, you're not picking your instrument. I'm like, we're going to pick the instrument that works for you. Because I have a lot of kids, they want to play trumpet. They're never going to have a good trumpet embouchure. Oh, I want to play flute. They're never going to have a good flute embouchure. So I try to, first of all, find the instrument that I think is going to work best for them. And then like specifically for like brass instruments, I buzz a lot. We buzz rhythms. Um, you know, we do basic rhythms. I'm lucky where uh, the school district that I teach in, the general music program is very focused on rhythm reading and steady beat and solfege. So they kind of have a little bit of a knowledge, but obviously for brass playing, I, I put some rhythms on the board and we'll buzz them. You know, um, if there are woodwinds in there, they take the head joint off, you know, take the mouthpiece out and, and, and make sounds along with us. I also for brass, are we talking mainly about brass players? Are you guys, is this mainly brass that we're dealing with? Okay. Um, yeah, mainly brass. I'm a big believer in free buzzing. And what is buzzing without the mouthpiece? Um, and there's a couple. There's a couple of little, very short things that I do with all of my fifth grade brass players every day for the entire first year. And the first thing that I do is I just have them set their embouchure. I just have them make the M syllable, M, and then flex. And I always I equate it to like flexing your bicep with the corners. You want to feel it, and we just hold our embouchure for like 20 seconds. You know, just as the first thing we do, hold your embouchure. And while they're doing that. I'm doing like little, you know, like rudimental stuff with my snares, you know, and then I, I'm, I'm moving around the room because unfortunately I have mixed in instrumentation with every individual class. Um, after that, um, I'll, and it takes a long time for them to be su successful at free buzzing because it's hard. Um, it's, it's super, super hard, but I would give it a shot and I work on it for about 30 to 45 seconds. I just say, just try it. You know, like right now, I haven't played in a few days. I don't even think I, you know, okay, I can kind of do it. Um, but I work with them to get that. And it will feel like maybe it's not working for a while, but that's the best way to start developing the strength here. Yeah, you know, and, and the power here. And the faster that the kids understand that this being kind of still and strong and flexed and firm, I try to use those words, not tight, you know, um, um, is a great way. And then we take the mouthpiece out. And like I said, I'll put on a song. I'll put on a song like, um, like Lady Gaga, Bad Romance is a great way for them to buzz open fifths. Da, 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 da. It's a perfect fifth, you know, find stuff like that. And they're going to sound terrible. They're not, it's not going to sound like the melody, but they're buzzing and they're building strength. And so I do that for about like the whole process. It's about three minutes, but I do it every every time, all year long, and that that gets them going. When um when we play, um I do a lot of I play you play I play you play I play you play I do a lot of that. Um, and how I explain it to the kids is I ask them at the beginning of towards the beginning of the year I ask them the question I'm like How did you learn how to talk? And, they're, and they think about it for a second. They're like, I don't know, I just talk. Dur, 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 dur. But eventually I get them to understand that they, got, they learned how to talk by listening to other people talk and trying to mimic that. And that's what we do. That's what we should be doing with brass playing and woodwind playing is I'm, 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 I usually have trumpet because I'm a trombone player, baritone player, but I have my trumpet out. It's easier to hold and you know, move around. So I'll play and they're like, well, Mr. Larson, why are you playing? I'm on because you need to hear what it's supposed to sound like and then do what you can to match that sound. Now they don't, they can't, but 
after time, it, it, it seems to help. I do a lot of that. I like them to hear what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, and then I just, I use a book. I use essential elements. Honestly, any book you use, I think it's fine. You, it, it's, again, it's, it's another tool. You just have to implement your strategies through that tool. You know, and I, I mean, like, I just go right through the book. Like it's in one note at a time, you know, it teaches them those first CDEFG, you know, on trumpet, you know, we teach them those first five notes and then we start playing those little dumb songs. You know, kidding me? Hot Cross Buns is like a rite of passage, you know, like I, I teach that every year, you know, you know, merrily we roll along, you know, go tell Aunt Rhody. all those little three note songs, four note songs. I just, I just pound them on it. I try to play a lot. It's, it's hard uh, because they do need a lot of information because, you know, at the beginning of the year, I'll walk down the line and say, no, you hold it like this. No, you hold it like this. No, put your hand here. No, do that. And then I go to the next kid. Then I go to the next kid and then we play. And that process takes almost the whole rehearsal for the first few weeks, but then we get faster, you know, and that's how I do it. Very systematic, very common sense, or but kind of focused on strength around the corners of the embouchure. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. What else we got? Nothing? That's it? Oh, man. That's it? <laughs> you got a question? Uh, yeah. not a question. I, I, I just want to go back on something you said earlier, which was the fact that you probably stand for warm-ups in an arc rather than a circle. Um, <clears throat> I just like to add that I, I find that there are different reasons for doing that. Sometimes it's for the kids' benefit, sometimes it's for your benefit. Mm -hmm. And I find that when you're stood in the circle and they are playing or facing you, you could be facing one section, but you're still hearing what's happening elsewhere. Whereas sometimes when you're in the arc and you're stood in front of one section, it's not so easy to hear the other end of the arc. And therefore from a a staff or an instructor point of view, I find that very beneficial. Yeah. Whereas I do understand what you're saying about the scatter and things like that, which is giving the kids the confidence to understand that they're no longer stood next to somebody playing the same part as them. They're now hearing parts that they, they never knew existed in that piece of music. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and like I said, there, there's a million ways to do this right. And, and like I said, the best horn line in the world gets in that circle every day and, and they do it, you know, and I told, I, I'm totally cool with it. I, I don't, I couldn't even really exactly tell you why I went from circle to arc. I'm not really sure. I think I just changed it. I, I have no idea. There's really, like there's really for the arc or the circle. I, I mean, they're both great. They both have benefits. And I do like how you kind of pointed out that we implement strategies for different reasons. Some of them is for our students and some of them are for us. You know, some of them are for the staff. Some of them is for the color guard. Some of it's for the percussion section, you know? So yeah, but definitely the, the word I like to use is strategy. You need to be thinking like strategically about the, that situation. And like, obviously the circle, what you said is a great way to hear everything going on around you. You know, and if you intermix in a circle, you can really pick out the kids that are struggling very easily. If you go intermix sections in a circle, um, you can very much do that. I, I think I think like the main reason that I changed for high school and just went arc and scatter was mainly for time. I, I knew I wanted to change like formations, but I don't have a ton of time at the high school level for warming up. So. Um, you may not want to do it. It may not be a strategy that makes sense for you because you're like, Man, I have an hour and 20 minute rehearsal. I'm not going to be in the warm up arc or a scatter formation for 45 minutes. You know, it may be in your best interest to set up that circle and, and get through the warm up and, and get some good work done and then get out on the field and do your own thing. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Not anti, not anti circle. What else? I've got a question again, Travis. Yeah. So say it's a show day, you're in, in the lot. Mm -hmm. um, what what would you choose to do? Would you go for the big impact hits so it sounds good for the crowd, hypes up the people, or would you 
try and neaten up those little intricate bits that aren't quite which which sort of strategy would you go for well we were talking about recruiting um recruiting i think now for kids is all about lot videos like go on youtube and like i started asking when i was at auditions for and I'm going to kind of go around the world to get to your actual answer. But, but I think that the lot, like what you do in the lot is super, super important and you can use it very effectively for recruiting. When I was at Boston Crusaders auditions and I think 2018, I was in the room with like 47 mellophone players. And I asked them all, all, who's in this room right now because of a YouTube video they saw of the Boston Crusaders warming up. And half the room raised their hand because they they all want they all wanted to go and and see Gino and see Gino do his little hop and blah, you know go crazy or Matt Harloff or John Meehan you know they see these videos with and it's a really really good way for you to reach kids you know that hey check this out this is what you're going to be able to do now what do I think is the most effective use of your time in the lot besides you know maybe that yes. It's all about preparing to perform. Like, like um, Gina, who is like my mentor and he's amazing, I love the guy. Um, he always said, we could get off the bus, walk to the gate and perform the show. We don't need to do that. He's like, it's all about mental preparation um, for the performance. Now, what I think is the best, what works for groups that I've worked with and how I, you know, use with my high schools. So I always set up like the arc or the circle, get it set up. And I do something long Tony, just to get them blowing a little bit, you know, just to get the air moving through the horns a little bit. And more importantly, to quiet their minds, to quiet their minds. The one of the exercises that's in the packet that you can get from me uh, is called meditation. And it is meant to do exactly that. It's supposed to be a mind calming and, you know, intonation, blend balance, you know, you know, all that good, but it's meant to be easy to play. So you can just focus on your tone and quiet your mind. You know, I always say, leave your bag of trash at the door. You know, like everyone carries around a bag of trash with them. Well, leave it at the door. This is band time. We don't have to worry about that shit right now. You know, leave your bag of trash at the door. Let's play meditation, quiet our minds. You know, I like to have um, very quiet warm-ups where there's not very much talking going on with the members, preferably none. But you know, some groups are a little looser at their warm-up. That's fine. I think with younger members, the structure and the quiet really helps get them focused on their performance. Um, I will definitely run excerpts from the show. I won't if I don't have a met. If I don't have a Met, I'm not, I'm not going to run it. Now, here's the one thing that I have been unsuccessful at with the band directors that I work for in Arizona. There's the moment, and I don't know whether you all do this, but where, all right, let's get the band together with the drum line and the pit, and let's run the whole show. I have directors do a full run through of the show. And I'm like, great. So the last thing that we're doing is putting them in a listening situation that they are never in before we go perform. Now, I, the benefits are obviously sounds good. The kids get excited, you know, and that's beneficial. I've always preferred to try to get them to that kind of really, really kind of where they're tasting blood and ready. Ah, oh, let's go get them. You know, I, I, I prefer to do that with just you know, the brass section in the arc, not even with really too much with the woodwinds. Like we'll, we'll get with the woodwinds and play a couple of things to make sure our pitches are lining up, you know, the pitch is lining up, but like, you know, we, we talked about simulating performance situations. I think it's a bad idea to simulate uh, not a performance situation right before they perform. And also I feel that you're just beating up your trumpet section. You know, I mean, and, and I don't mind beating up, beating up the horn line a little bit. They're used to doing run throughs at the end of a three hour, four hour rehearsal, you know? So they're used to like doing a full run through kind of taxed a little bit, but man, I, 
I like bringing them out there fresh and seeing what they can do, you know, and the, and, and the lot is definitely a science because you can get your kids too fired up and, and you're going to get individual bells all over the place, you know, so you got to find that you, you got, you got to know the pulse of your ensemble, you know, you got to, you got to learn where kind of where they're most effective and get them there and, and get them there. Now with most groups, yeah, we play some excerpts, you know, play the little core song, you know, like, you know, we played Giant at uh, Boston. Uh, we played like Rocky Point Holiday at Cadets, you know, we did, we did a lot of stuff like that at Cadets. We did a lot of like tunes. And with Blue Stars, we're um, definitely going to run show excerpts. You know, we've got our loud progressions that we blow and, you know, get everyone hyped up, you know, and we have lot pieces. We'll play La Vie, like our core song. And Ryan Williams, who's my assistant and is a kick-ass arranger and composer, I'm really lucky to have him, um, did a great arrangement of like the Disney soaring over the world music. Uh, we actually released a YouTube video virtual of that. You should check that out. Um, but we'll play that, you know, and, and then we'll go to the show and be great, you know, but that, that, that's kind of how I go about it, but it's different for everyone. I have some groups where I do very little. We play for 15 minutes and they're ready. You know, I have some groups that we're out there for an hour, hour and a half, you know, really, really doing the, doing everything. They like to go through a whole routine before they perform. But yeah. So I guess I sort of answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. It made sense. <laughs> yeah. But the lot, I, I love the lot. I, I, I live for the lot. Like the reason I teach drum corps is for the lot, not for the show. I haven't enjoyed a performance, I think in 25 years. I, like I don't enjoy watching my kids perform because I'm always just so hyper-focused on what they're doing wrong. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, oh, we got to fix that. We got to fix that. Oh, wow, that didn't go well. Instead of, wow, this is really great. Where I totally have that feeling in the lot where I'm like, my horn line sounds amazing. I'm so smart. You know, this is great. You know, I, I tend to kind of enjoy that more than the actual performance itself. You know, I'm sitting there like this the whole time. But yeah. What else? I don't want to ask you all the questions. I <laughs> want someone else to have a go. <laughs> Go ahead, ask away. I've probably got about another 20-ish minutes, so. Have you got anything you'd want to ask about the activity in the UK? Or? Sure. Um, I know, well, I, I think that you enlighten me a little bit when it's not scholastic. So, like, the like schools don't have marching bands? There's, there used to be Trinity School who had a show band, but they uh -huh. were, like, the exception, not the rule. So it's all pretty what much. Are the kids, what do the kids do? They get no arts education in school, or do they have like a general music class? Or um, I mean, sorry, I'll let someone else answer. <laughs> I I mean, um, back when I was at school, uh, the the arts um, was very good, but over time, it's uh, the government hasn't really invested in the performing arts and yeah obvi obviously schools ha have had to cut back yeah yeah well i mean you know we we've definitely dealt with a lot of that in the u.s as well i mean when i was you know when i was a student like i felt like band programs were much more valued uh, than they are now but I also think that band directors back then in the US did a better job of showing their value um, to the campus and to the community where a lot of directors now just like to kind of um, kind of sit in their office and you know fiddle around with their spreadsheets as opposed to like getting their band to a, one of the basketball games, you know, or like a women's basketball game on a Thursday night, you know, and having a little 20 person pep band there. Like, like, when I was, I was a high school band director for a little while and, and I was like, oh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> but when I was doing it, like the main thing I wanted to do was to show the value of the program so I could get what I wanted. 
it was totally selfish, but I'm like, here, I'm going to give you this product. Like you, um, you didn't have your band performing at lunchtime during the pep rally before now you do, you know, or this community event, but yeah, we unfortunately too, I mean, with, um, well, I mean, you, you've seen who we've had as president the last four years. It certainly has not been focused on, you know, education in general, let alone arts education, music education. You know, I still work with teachers. Like I worked with a fifth grade teacher a couple of days ago and she told me eh, band should just be after school, which is kind of what you guys are dealing with right now. And I was, I looked at, I looked her right in the eye and I just went, man, I'm so grateful that you don't make any decisions that matter to me because, because your opinion is so short-sighted and I don't know about you. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we got involved in education because in music education, because we had an educator that reached us. We had a great experience, you know, but like I was in sales for a long time and it wasn't what I learned in math that made me successful. It was all of the, it was all the secondary skills that I learned from band, you know, thinking outside of the box, you know, being put into a student leadership role, you know, uh, working with others, you know, um, you know, like all the multiple responsibilities that we handle as musicians were really, really super helpful, you know, but I, I mean, obviously you're not going to be able to go to whoever your prime minister is or whatever is the guy with the weird blonde hair. Right. And, um, um, and, and tell them, look, we have all these things, put music back in schools, but yeah, that that's a bummer. And it's really, really difficult. Like I, I recruiting has just got to be a freaking nightmare. It's got to be a nightmare. At my, oh, wait, I want to see this at my high school. At least it seemed. Yeah. You got two coming. Yeah, I'm, I want to make sure I see it. I want to get rid of this tab so I can actually close. There we go. There we go. My high school. Most of the other students will want to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the program has got to be convenient and accessible to the student. Or they're not going to... Um, so the other thing I'd add to Sam is just certainly the school he went to comes from a background where for 50 years they've had a really strong music service compared with other local council areas. Yeah. So I think it's probably a bit more embedded there. Um, I just wanted to quickly answer your first question, your earlier question about what have we got because we've not got bands and how does it work? We've yeah. got a very strong tradition, A, of amateur orchestras in the UK and even more so and relevant to us around brass bands. Yeah. Um, you know, Black Dyke and people like that. You know, we've got hundreds yeah. of brass bands across the country. So there is, you know, Luke and I have both got a background as much in brass bands as marching bands. So yeah. we do have roots to get people in that way. That's cool. Yeah, I show, are you kidding me? I show my, I show my band kids, Corey band videos all the time. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, and like Corey and Black Dyke are like, it's, it's, it's freaking stupid how good they are. It's, 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 it's disgusting how good they are, but yeah. 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 What's really funny though, is our band in Revolution is from the same village as Black Dyke and we do all the community activities and they do none of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's tough. Yeah, like I um, and and like the the brass band music is such a huge part of DCI now. Like I mean, it's uh, ever since Crown started really doing like a lot of the like Peter Graham stuff. Yeah, I know we did we did Peter Graham at Boston in 2019. We did the Shoulders of Giants, and then I don't know if it's Peter Graham. It may be somebody else. We did the Breathless Hallelujah the year before. It's a brass band piece. Um, I don't know who writes it. I think it's somebody else. I'm gonna look it up on my phone because it'll drive me crazy. But uh, could be Paul Lovett Cooper. He's I know he's done a lot out in the states with marching bands and drum corps. Cool. Yeah, like it, it's it's weird how it's like com it's completely different. You know, like the end result is the same, but like everything that builds up to it. You know, like your your traditions and and like your current situation is so different than ours and it's kind of gives um, give me a little perspective too you know because you always think that where like where we're at in Arizona is certainly not like um optimal for band 
like Texas. Like, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the state of Texas, but the bands that come out of the state of Texas now are like, they're just as good as drum corps almost. Like they're, they're, they're like a 15th place drum corps, you know? And, and they're amazing, but they get tons of support. And I, so I'm here in Arizona going, oh man, we have it so bad, but now I'm talking to you and you guys don't even have band in school. So, I mean, that's like crazy to me that, that a society as like centered in like culture and the arts as, as at least I perceive England to be, doesn't have band in school. That's just unbelievable to me. I can't even believe it. Uh, we we don't have band in schools, but we have choir in schools. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like when, at my junior high, at my junior high, we have intermediate band, advanced band, uh, beginning guitar, advanced guitar. Uh, the choir the choir program. She just won Arizona like state educator of the year. She's amazing, but she has a men's choir. She has her. The, she calls it bel canto it's her best female choir she has a mixed choir musical theater and drama all at a junior high and it's not it's and, and we are not like some like mecca for the arts at all but we get a lot you know we get a lot and we have a beautiful auditorium where i can fit 600 people in there to watch my band well before covid you know but now I can't fit anybody in there to watch my band, but you know, we have all these really, really great tools, you know, and that's why, you know, we have, you know, all these great groups in DCI because they've gone through these music programs and now they're in college and, and they're just, they're phenomenal. They've been playing for eight, nine years, you know, they've been taught by great people. So that's, they can't march like us though. I guess in the UK though we haven't got the same sort of infrastructure. I mean, I've been to I've been to Houston quite a few times with my my work because mm -hmm. um, I work in the oil and gas industry, so uh, over there quite often. But you only have to look at what facilities all the schools got in terms of stadiums and stuff like that. Yeah. We have none of that over here. We're lucky we get a you know a running track at a secondary school now. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, so we we don't have the facilities to sort of bring these massive bands together i mean you know back in the day the, the band that i manage used to use the um sports hall of a local school you know but that was just big enough for about 50 people mm -hmm. in the band you know so, so you know to take it any bigger than that especially if you're in you know obviously over in the states the weather depending on where you are could be could be very good over here you know it's it's minus two this morning when we sort of get up so that's, in, that's in celsius though obviously actually yes i am it's going to be 72 and sunny Oof. yeah you know but, so like, where i live the weather is amazing but we're in the desert so when we get to band camp in july it's 115 and we're out there and we're out there crazy, just just pounding it out on the turf. But yeah, no, Houston, um, like the um, visual caption head for Blue Stars is a band director in Houston. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and um, the football stadiums in Texas, like, are unbelievable. We don't have that. We well, I went to um, I was over there a couple of years ago, and one of our uh, one of our clients gave us some tickets to the rodeo. So I've been to the to the rodeo in Houston. And yes, the stadium was just like yeah. mind blowing. Heard a lot of yeehaws, I bet. Yeehaw. <laughs> yeah. No, like, yeah, those state, like football, American football, especially in Texas, is mm. a religion. Like, that, that's the best way I could describe it. Like, they had football this fall. Like, with COVID, there was nothing that was going to cancel football in Texas. That's what I said. I said, you know, we're in big trouble when they cancel football in Texas, but they never really did it. They just got sick. Yeah, I mean, they just they just did it and got sick. But yeah, like we don't have that type of thing. But I mean, we have some of my schools have decent sized stadiums with just like, you know, like one level of bleachers, you know, not like three levels of bleachers and all that stuff. But it's uh, yeah, it's crazy. I do need to kind of wrap it up. Um, I've got some other stuff going on today, but like, 
like I said, um, my email address, I'll, I'll type it in the chat one more time. It's brass at bluestars.org. And look, I know a lot of people say, hey, reach out to me, no big deal, and never get back to you. Reach out to me. If you have any questions or if you get into a season and you're, you're actually doing an in-person season and you, you did a run through that you just maybe have some questions, send it to me. I'd love to listen to it and give you a little feedback if, if you want it, or just, you know, or if you're in the States, you know, for a drum corps show, come by, you know, come by and say hello. Um, you know, um, you know I, I, um, I'm usually pretty quick to respond because I got my phone on me all the time and I get all my email on my phone. But if you do email me, I'll send you that packet. Um, like I said, I got a bunch of stuff going on. So probably not till like tomorrow night or Monday. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was great hanging, hanging with you guys. I'd love to do it again sometime. You know, just let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, Luke, I'll get you um, this video uh, as soon as I can. Oh, thanks again so much for doing this, Trevor. No, no problem at all. It, you know, um, you know I, hope, I hope you all are able to kind of get through this and, and get the recruiting going and getting back to doing your thing, you know, and, and, and doing what we love. But um, it's been great talking to you. Um, cool. I will see you all later. Once I leave, I think it's going to boot you all off. So have a great Enjoy day. Thank you. Easy. Thank you.